Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as we celebrate National Hispanic Heritage Month at the Pasadena Public Library. As you know, National Hispanic Heritage Month is from September the 15th to October the 15th. And today is our very um, first program and we are delighted to be able to and listen to and have join us today, Alex Espinoza. So Alex is going to be talking about his books and his writing journey. And it's going to be a very informative and interesting um, afternoon. So I um, want to tell you a little bit of how the afternoon is going to be set up. Um, thank you for joining. If you could please mute yourself. Um, there's also questions can be put in chat. And at the end of the program, I will ask the chat questions. And Alex has agreed to answer um, all the questions that you um, want to ask his presentation today. Um, we have a live transcript. So you need to um, enable that on your computer. It's on the um, screen share of all of the different icons at the bottom of your computer, or it could be at the top. It's CC live transcript. Also, Alex has very nicely agreed to be able to be recorded today to put on the Pasadena Public Library YouTube channel. And um, you can go to it or probably up maybe tomorrow or the next day and you can review it and share it with your friends. Um, and so we appreciate his willingness to do that for us today. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about um, the Hispanic Heritage Month. As I said, it encompasses September 15th to October the 15th. It um, is to honor the cultures and contributions of Hispanic and Latin Americans with a wide variety of events to demonstrate their culture, their history, and um, their achievements in the United States. We have a very elaborate brochure that you can pick up at all of our branches. You can also see this brochure online under Pasadena Public Library on our webpage. It is in English and it is in Spanish. Um, our programs this year include programs for families, crafts, takes and makes, where you are actually exposed to um, different Hispanic crafts, programs for children, such as story times, for teens, authors and the journey series that Alex is participating in today, and um, beyond the book, book discussion groups for um, book group members at our different branches and anyone can join those, um, and a film series. So please um, go to our Pasadena Public Library website and look at our brochures, uh, our brochure in English and in Spanish, and select what you would like to join. You can come to all of them and or none, but we hope you will come to several of them and at least watch them on YouTube if the times do not work out for you. Um, we have art night this year on Friday, October the 8th, and that will be um, Hispanic Heritage Month activities as well, and that is virtual. So thank you so much for participating today. Um, we are featuring one of Alex's books, but he has written several books and he will be talking about them. But today's book is Still Water Saints, and we have it in the Pasadena Public Library for you to check out and enjoy. So let me tell you a little bit about Alex. Um, he was born in Tijuana, Mexico, to parents from the state of Pachokchan. Now, I'm not sure that I am saying that correctly, um, to parent and was raised in suburban Los Angeles. He holds a BA in creative writing from the University of California, Riverside, and a master's in fine arts from UC Irvine's program in writing. His first novel, Still Water Saints, was published by Random House in 2007 and was named a Barnes and Noble Discover Great New Writers Selection. The book was released simultaneously in Spanish 
under the title Los Santos de Agua Mansa, California, translated by Lillian Valenzuela. The second novel, The Five Acts of Diego Leon, was also published by Random House in March 2013. His fiction has appeared in several anthologies and journals, including Islandia, A Literary Journey Through California's Inland Empire, the Southern California Review. His essays have been published at the salon.com, the New York Times Magazine, and the other Latin at Writing Against a Singular Identity, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, Los Angeles Magazine, as part of the historic Chicano chapbook series. He's also reviewed books for LA Times, the American Book Review, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and NPR. He has numerous, numerous awards, including a 2009 Margaret Bridgman Fellowship in Fiction to the Bread Loaf Writers Conference, a 2014 Fellowship in Prose from the National Endowment for the Arts, a 2014 American Book Award from Before Columbus Foundation for the Five Acts of Diego Leon, and a 2019 Fellowship to McDowell. His newest book, Cruising an Intimate History of a Radical Pastime, was published by the Unnamed Press in June 2019. He's also involved deeply with the Puente Project, a program designed to help first generation community college students make a successful transition to a university. He lives in Los Angeles with his partner, Kyle, and he is the Thomas Riviere Endowed Chair of Creative Writing at the University of California, Riverside. Um, his book, Still Water Saints, is imaginative, inspirational, lyrical, and absolutely beautifully written. It evokes the unpredictability of life and the resilience of the spirit through the journeys of the people of Agua Mansa, and especially of the one woman at the center of it all. Of it all. There are stories of faith and betrayal, love and loss, the bonds of family and community, and the constancy of change. Um, you probably all know the author, Lisa C. She said that it's fresh, magical, beautiful, and evocative. And with that, I am delighted to welcome Alex to talk to you and share his writing with you. Pas um, Alex, just aside, um, knows Pasadena well. He used to come and visit his grandmother's house um, for the Tournament of Roses on January 1st. Alex and all of his cousins would go to the Rose Parade. Um, so we're very happy to be welcoming Alex back to Pasadena to present um, today. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much for that very warm welcome, Christine. It's really nice to be um, having this opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, you know, as I said, um, when we started, um, you know, before we started this prop, this uh, uh, recording, um, yeah, it is. It's really interesting um, to uh, you know to be doing this um, and and remembering all of those. Uh, experiences that I had as a as a as a child, um, you know, going going to Pasadena, um, you know, spending time with my grandparents. Uh, at the time, of course, it it didn't it didn't feel like um, that was anything that I wanted to do. I didn't want to be anywhere near my grandparents when I was younger. Of course, I always wanted to sort of be on my own, um, and 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 so it was always uh, it kind of felt like a chore, but but actually now when I think about it, you know, um, those are, those are moments that I really do miss, um, you know, as a, as a, as a kid, those, those, those special moments. But at the time, you know, you always feel like, uh, you know, uh, the last thing you want to be doing is spending time with your grandparents because it's kind of boring. We used to, uh, go to the parade every morning. We'd spend the night on December 31st and go to the parade on January 1st, every morning, uh, waking up really early and um, staking out a spot there on Colorado Boulevard and uh, watching the parade and then going home, 
to my grandparents' house, you know, having a big dinner, a big, big breakfast, big lunch, and then heading home. Um, and I remember one year uh, as a kid, my, my grandmother lived on Orange Grove Boulevard. And there were a couple of times that we caught, uh, we were there late enough uh, in the, not the day, but in the week, because they would leave the floats at the park. Um, and I remember there were a couple of times that we caught the floats going in the opposite direction when you know they you know cordon off the street and I remember they would drive them across my grandmother's house in front in the front yard through the front on, on Orange Grove Boulevard going in the opposite direction so it was always like we saw the floats <coughs> coming down and they were full of people and they were waving and uh, and then we would see them when they were going back and that was when they were empty and no one was on their waving and they weren't horses or, or, or uh, marching bands. Um, and so, yeah, Pasadena is always featured really, really um, big in my imagination. And um, I used to work on Colorado Boulevard also. I sold furniture at uh, a furniture store on, uh, in Old Town when, when Old Town was just starting out. Um, this was in the mid nineties when it was sort of the place to go to when everyone discovered, you know, that there were these really old, amazing buildings and they were all converted to, you know, bookstores and coffee shops and lofts and, and really, uh, you know, uh, really cool shops. And I worked at one of those. So it's really a, a pleasure to be um, having this opportunity to talk with you and to talk with everybody that's affiliated with the library um, during this important month. Um, and, and also to, to you know to say that libraries are a writers you know librarians are a writer's best friend really when we're doing research and when we're doing all the important work that um, goes into a book that that you can't see when you have it like this it, we, we get a lot of information necessary information from our librarians who really do know uh, how to point us in the right direction and so, you know, a librarian is a writer's best friend and, and the library is a place that a writer always wants to be. Um, so it's a real thrill to be here and I have this opportunity to talk with all of you. I am currently not at my home in Los Angeles. I am out in the desert. I am in Palm Springs right now. I'm actually in Desert Hot Springs and I am spending a little bit of time. I'll be spending the next couple of days um, at a resort spa because it's been a very challenging year and a half for two years for a lot of us. And um, I need some, some, some rest and relaxation. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm happy to talk with all of you and, and to read um, a, from my first book. Um, I'm, I'll read just a couple of short sections. And um, Christine, I think we said it's maybe, y'all want me to end at like five, maybe 5.30 and do questions. Does that sound about right? Okay. Okay. Oh, I think you're on mute. You're on mute. Oh, that's weird. I'm so. Oh yeah, there you are. I can see you. I can hear you now. We'll have time for questions. Sorry, she's still oh, muted. I'm still oh, muted. Oh, you're not muted now. Oh, wait, you are. Can you hear me now? Okay, put your questions in chat, please. Alex is gonna answer every, every question we have. So okay. thank you very much. I don't know, I hope something's not happening with my Zoom. You sound fine now. So so should I end at about 5.30? My, my 5.30, 5.40, that'll be fine. Thank okay. you. Okay, all right, that sounds great. So, I, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I started, uh, you know, my first book um, is this one, Stillwater Saints. And I started this book um, when I was an undergrad at, at, at UC Riverside at the institution that I now teach. And, um, you know, at the time I was working, uh, at the mall, I was working retail. I was in my late twenties. This was after I finished working in Pasadena, and uh, I was in my late twenties. I had moved back home um, to pursue a, a degree 
in writing because I had this crazy idea that I wanted to be a writer. And I um, moved back home and, and applied to UC Riverside and I got in and I declared a creative writing major and I had no idea what I was doing. I had absolutely no idea. I just, people would always tell me that I was a great writer and that I should really, I had a gift. Um, and I, but I didn't know what that meant. And so I, the first class I took was a beginning fiction writing class with um, uh, my professor, then professor, now colleague, uh, Susan Strait. And um, Susan really sort of took a liking to what I was doing and what I was writing and really encouraged me to, to continue to pursue it. And I, um, you know, I didn't really have any um, role models around me. I didn't really know what I was doing. And so Susan kind of was my guide in a lot of ways. And, you know, I would work, you know, I would take classes in the mornings, work in the afternoons at the mall, folding t-shirts, uh, come home exhausted late at night and sit down and write my, my stories and um, late into the night until like one or two in the morning uh, when my house was quiet and no one was awake. And I started this book in that way. Um, and it actually became um, a uh, sort of, I didn't want to write a novel. I was afraid of that word novel. Um, the word novel sounded really uh, daunting and, and big and um, intimidating. And so um, Susan, one of the things that you have to do when you're a creative writing major at UC Riverside is do what's called a senior thesis. You have to work on this sort of, it's a, a sort of, I think it's like 50 pages of kind of a larger, you know, thing uh, before you graduate. And Susan would always say, well, you know, the minute people sort of, students start, you know, looking at senior thesis, they want to start writing a novel. And I was petrified of that word. And I thought, well, I don't want to write something that, that big. So maybe I'll work on like, stories, chunks, I'll take these little sections um, and, and work on that. And that's really how this book began. It started with um, <coughs> visits to a shop that was near my mother's house called the Botanica. And for those of you that don't know what a Botanica is, um, there are shops that are found mainly in, 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 um, in communities that are largely Latino. And um, there are shops where you can go and get herbs and, and teas and candles and all kinds of kind of folk remedies. And um, uh, I started visiting this shop a lot just because I was really kind of fascinated by the uh, textual elements of them, the smells and the sights and the sounds and, you know. Um, and so I got it in my head that I wanted to write a series of stories that focused on some of the characters, the customers that come into the shop. And that's kind of how this book began. And it sort of started as this, um, uh, these cycles of, of tales of individuals who, who would go into the shop and who would um, uh, procure items and, and meet the woman that runs the shop. And she's an older woman in her seventies named Perla, and Perla's kind of the glue that holds uh, the community together. And um, that's kind of how it started. And it began as kind of a, um, a, uh, uh, an experiment in a lot of ways on my end, a, a way to uh, write about a community without really sort of taking uh, a chunk out of this, um, this idea of writing a novel. And, um, I kept writing it and writing it and writing it. And then when I got to graduate school, I, when I applied to graduate programs, I got into the writing program at UC Irvine. I was very lucky. It's a really fantastic program. And they said, well, what do you want to work on? And I said, well, I've got this book, you know, um, this idea. And they said, well, that sounds like a great idea. So they gave me, you know, more thumbs up. And I said, okay, keep working on it. And that's kind of what I did. And that's kind of how the book, you know, happened. And um, the book focuses on, the residents of a, a fictional community called Agua Mansa um, in Southern California. And um, so you have some of the, some of the characters are, are customers of Perla's 
who come into the shop or who encounter her in one way or another. And then sort of threaded throughout the book is Perla's own narrative. And it's a, a kind of a year in her life where she is dealing with a little bit of a, a crisis of faith in that she's looking around and she's realizing that the community that she um, had so um, faithfully served for so many years has changed, it's become something else. And she doesn't really know whether she fits in that new version of it anymore. Um, and, and so she, she sort of, in addition to that, um, a young man comes into the shop who um, presents Perla with um, a situation that she really isn't equipped to handle. Um, and it's a situation that really forces her to, um, you know, ask deep questions about her own motives and her own um, uh, drives and ambitions and why she's doing what she's doing. So it's kind of, it's kind of the book in a nutshell. Um, this, I'm gonna read you um, two of, I'm gonna read you a, a couple of Perla sections um, and they're short. Um, this first section takes place at the very beginning of the book. And it's when Perla's closing her shop and she lives close to the Botanica. Um, and I think that's all you need to know. Yeah. The iron security guard, guide, gate, the iron security gate unfolded like the bellows of an accordion as Bedla pulled it along the rail in front of the door. She snapped the padlock shut, turned around the corner of the building and headed home. Her house was close, just across the empty lot next to the shopping center. Wild sage and scrub grew beside the worn path that cut through the field. Boys sometimes rode their bikes there doing tricks and wheelies as they bumped over mounds and brakes, falling down, laughing and scraping their knees, their faces coated with grime. Their tires left thin tracks that looped around the salt cedar trees, around the soiled mattresses and old washers and sinks that were dumped here. People told of a curse on these grounds of a group of monks traveling through Agua Mansa in the days when California was still a part of Mexico, back before states were shapes on a map. They said a tribe of Indians had massacred the monks. They skinned them and scattered their body parts around the lot for the crows. Still others said Mexican settlers had been lynched from the branches of the cedars by angles who stole their land for the railroads. Seeing a piece of stone, Perla wondered about the monks and those men dangling from branches, a tooth, part of a toe. Empty soda cans and wrappers were caught under boulders and discarded car parts. What would the monks think about having a tire for a headstone, a couch for a marker? She thought about her husband, Guillermo, of his tombstone, of the thick green lawns of the cemetery where he was buried. When she reached her house and stepped inside, the air was warm and silent. She put her purse down on the rocking chair near the front door and went around, pushing the lace curtains back and cracking open the windows. She breathed in the scent of wood smoke from someone's fireplace down the street, a smell that reminded her of her father toasting out avanzo beans when she was little. She went into the kitchen and looked for something to eat, but there was nothing. Dinner was a bowl of instant oatmeal with two slices of dry toast, which she took out to the patio. The night was cold and the steam from the oatmeal rose up and fogged her glasses as she spooned it in her mouth. Police sirens wailed down the street and dogs answered their cries lonely and beautiful. She looked up and in the flashing light saw a set of glowing red eyes. Bella flick, 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 flicked on the porch light. It was an opossum, its fur dingy and gray, the tips and insides of its ears bright pink. It stood motionless behind the trunk of the organ pipe cactus, staring at her. It climbed to the top of the fence, making a low faint jingle as it moved. Bedla looked again. A small brass bell was tied to a piece of red yarn knotted around the opossum's tail. She took her spoon and threw it, and when it hit the bottom of the fence, the animal darted, the clatter of the bell frantic. The opossum disappeared 
behind the branches of the avocado tree and down the other side of the fence into the empty lot, the ringing growing fainter and fainter. From under the kitchen sink, behind a pile of cloths and old sponges she could never bring herself to throw away was a bottle of rum. She poured some into a cup and took a drink, then another, and the warmth calmed her nerves. She imagined the ghosts of the dead monks and the lynched men rising up from the ground, awakened by her thoughts. Curls of gray smoke at first, they slowly took human form. They walked in a straight line, one in front of the other, a slow procession following the opossum's tracks through the lot and back home. She took another drink and closed her eyes. That animal, it was a messenger. It was letting her know something was out there. It was coming. She sat down and waited for it. Um, so that's kind of Bedla's uh, intro to Bedla. Um, and kind of what I was trying to do there in that scene is kind of set up this idea that um, what's to come is something ominous, right? That um, she's about to experience a life-changing event. Uh, that's usually in, in, um, in uh, Native American and, and, and um, pre-Columbian mythology and lore. Uh, opossums are seen as kind of tricksters, as, um, as media intermediaries between the world of the living and the world of the dead. And so I really wanted to play with that sort of that ominous idea. And um, the, I included the bell because there's a reference somewhere that I read to, <coughs> to copper um, and to a red yarn, um, sort of playing on with this idea of, of, of messengers from the other world. So um, very kind of loaded. It was a very sort of uh, a symbol that was very loaded for me at that time. Um, I'm going to read you another of her sections. And what you need to know about this section that I'm going to read you is um, it's several months later. Um, and there's been a break in at her shop at the, at the Botanica. Uh, there was a stat, there's a statue in the window with uh, a statue of the, the patron saint of Anth St. Anthony. Um, and what they had done is in the window they had um, pinned dollar bills, fake dollar bills to him because you pin you pin them on the robes of the saints and that you know um, hope that means that hopefully you'll get some money right you'll come into some money so they're offerings offend us <coughs> so the win front window was broken somebody took the statue Bedla doesn't know why you find out in another section. <clears throat> She thinks it's something menacing. She thinks that it's also the, the young man that she was trying to help, but it actually turns out that it's these two other boys who um, uh, are, uh, one of them is in desperate need of, of money. And he thinks that that money is actually real, but it's not. And, um, and so Bedla thinks that it's something bad or um, this other young man that she's been trying to help um, who's, who ran away. Um, who has come back. So she really doesn't know what to make of it. <clears throat> and next to the Botanica was a 99 cent store, but that's closed. And um, a new shop has moved in. The dollar bills pinned to the statue's row weren't even real. It was play money from a game for children. The notes were green with fuzzy letters and numbers printed on fluorescent paper. Anyone standing in front of the display window that faced the parking lot could see that it was fake. The statue had always been there. The man who'd owned it before had placed the offerings to St. Anthony's Road. Take it out if you want, he said, the day he left for good. The window's due for a change anyway. But Bedla had decided to leave him there, even though the statue's robe was fading, the soft velvet so worn away that white netting seen in spots along the back. She noticed the shards first, the way they sparkle on the concrete walkway. One of the construction workers probably dropped something, she thought. She had her key in the lock and was turning the knob when she stopped and saw a piece of glass jutting out from one side of the front window. 
St. Anthony was gone. There was a rock on the floor beside the display table, which had been toppled over. She didn't go inside. She turned around, walked through the lot, and went back to her house. She found the baseball bat under the coffee table, grabbed it, and walked back to her shop. She inched open the door, gripping the bat with both hands. Aside from the window and the things inside of it, everything looked fine. Nothing else was missing or broken. She went straight for the closet and removed the loose floorboard. The lockbox where she kept the money was still there, the bills and rolls untouched. After she put the money in her register, she took the broom and went outside to sweep up the glass. A truck pulled up and parked a few feet away. It was one of the construction workers. He stepped out, a leather tool belt draped over his left shoulder, his black hair pulled back in a ponytail. He flicked a lit cigarette on the asphalt and grounded it into the, with his boot sole. He took his sunglasses off and watched her. You all right? He asked, pointing to the window. Everything cool? But Bella stayed quiet. He pointed to the window again. Ventana, that's how you say it, right? Somebody break? Quebro, Ventana, he said again, pointing. Policia come? I speak English, Bella said. Were you robbed? He walked up to the window, looked at it, then picked up the rock. Are you okay? I'm fine, she said. They only took my statue. It was here, it was in the window. She showed him the outline of the base. He wore a backward baseball cap, a patch of hair covering the tip of his chin, braided and thick as a root. Dominguez was written in marker across the dermis, he toted. He said, I got some extra sheets of plywood in the truck. Give me a sec and I can patch it up for you. He measured the window and the sheets of plywood, made small marks like X's in the wood and cut it with a saw he pulled out of a toolbox. He pointed with his chin to the bar near the front door. Is that your weapon? He asked. Someone gave it to me, she said. You could do some damage with a bat like that, he said. Sweat beads collected on his forehead, dampening his eyebrows. If I were a crook, I wouldn't mess with you. He rose and said, there, that should do it. That'll hold you up for now, but you're gonna wanna get it fixed real soon. I'll call the landlord. I can tell him what happened. We'll need to place an order for some glass. He grabbed a pad and a pencil and took some measurements. Bedla looked at the rock that he'd set on one of the chairs before pulling up the plywood. He said, you want me to take that? I'll toss it for you. Thank you, she said. He put it in the front seat beside him and drove away. She turned the fan on and stood there looking at the empty window, at the bent heads of the silver nails the construction worker had hammered. A statue, she thought. Who would want a statue? A statue of St. Anthony. Rodrigo, did he come back? Did I miss him again? The note that he'd left her was still taped to the register. She stopped to light the candle upon Soldado again and placed it at the foot of the statue of Santa Barbara. She busied herself the rest of the day by rearranging the statues on the shelves. She bought out some incense sticks and candles and tried to arrange them in a different order, making sure they were all visibly priced that each peg looked full and organized. She closed early, locking up at three. The construction worker had taken down the space for lease sign from the window of the shop. In its place was a new sign that read, coming soon, stigmata body piercing and tattoos. Bedla gripped the bat as she made her way home. She tried not to think about any of it. The 99 cent store closing down, the young boy Rodrigo running away, the mysterious note he left, if he would ever come back or not, the rock, that missing statue. Walking through the lot, she stepped cautiously to avoid killing any of the beetles that darted across the path. They dashed around in a panic, hiding under the leaves and shrubs below. Um, and um, those are all in third person. The sections of the customers who come into the shop <coughs> are told in first person. 
And um, I'm gonna read you a sh very short first person section. And the only reason I'm, I'm, I decided to read this was because it's actually, it takes place out here in the desert and I'm out here in the desert. Um, this is a story about a young man named Juan whose father died and he's having trouble grieving for the loss of his father. And he got really mad at his mother. His mother is a huge Elvis Presley fan, like crazy Elvis Presley fan, like she's collected everything. Um, and they got into a fight because Juan is upset that his mother isn't grieving for the loss of her father. Instead, she's sort of obsessed with Elvis. And they got into a huge fight and so he'd seen a sign uh, on the side, a billboard on the side of the freeway uh, advertising an Elvis Presley impersonator. And uh, his, his way to make it up to his mother was to take her to see this Elvis Presley impersonator. And also his girlfriend um, has called it quits with him because she, he's in a funk and she, doesn't know how to help him and she's frustrated with him and um his father had really liked his girlfriend when they met right before he died he died of emphysema um and so i think that's all you need to know the mountains off the ten fold in and out of one another the stereos playing alice's burning love and we drive with the windows rolled all the way down the wind kicks up dirt and gravel, and when sand gets lodged in my eyes, I rub until I can see clearly, concentrating hard on the asphalt before us. My mother had still been angry with me when I phoned her. I felt bad about our fight and asked her to give me a chance to make it up. I mentioned the show and offered to take her. After all, I said, it's not every day that a genuine Elvis Presley impersonator performs at an Indian casino near us. My girlfriend Deborah called me earlier today saying she was coming over to pick up her things. And I try hard to forget about it. Forget that when I get back to the apartment later tonight, she'll be there walking out of my life. At the casino, we sit next to a woman in leather sandals named Nora, who tells us the impersonator we're about to see is really a man named Denny Jenks from Modesto, California. She's attended at least 20 of his performances and she swears he's by far the best around. Nora tells my mother she's been to Graceland and visited Elvis's tomb. Hearing this, my mother smiles and Nora takes her hand. No words, Nora says, no words to describe it, honey. There are candles lit at each table and groups of people sit at attention waiting for the show to start. The disco globe above the room spins, casting specks of light across the dark walls. A woman up front faints before the music even begins. Still holding hands, Nora and my mother rise in unison. They stand on their chairs, wave bar napkins and crane their necks, looking past the rows of tables and benches, past the heads and through the mist of the figure in a powder blue jumpsuit who's just walked on stage. The spotlight falls on him, my mother and Nora scream and their faces turn red. They throw their heads back and fan themselves with the napkins they're holding. Now, here's my mother, Evelyn. She's just lost her husband to emphysema. Evelyn considers herself to be Elvis Presley's number one fan. She owns all of his movies and she likes to play his records every night. Evelyn has a scrapbook with clippings she began collecting years ago when she was a girl in Mexico. It's something she's proud of and remembers taking to, to school one day, showing it to her friends. She didn't allow them to touch the pages. She turned them herself, smoothing out the creases and bubbles and the clippings of her palms. Standing on a chair in an Indian casino, Evelyn's clutching the hand of a woman she's just met. Wearing a lavender poodle skirt that she just pulled from deep within her closet, Evelyn dances. Her skirt fans out, exposing the ruffled slip underneath. She wears a pair of black and white saddle shoes with bobby socks rolled all the way down to her ankles and an angora sweater with a furry collar. The two women close their eyes and dance. And with each step, with each steady rocking of the hips, they give themselves over, releasing part of themselves taking something new in. 
Later that night, walking through the door of my apartment, I find Deborah in the bedroom. Her clothes are folded and arranged in small neat piles on the bed. Her blow dryer and alarm clock are on the floor near her high heels and tennis shoes, her socks and her nylons. My father's gold lighter taps against the loose change in my pocket and in it, I hear his voice. I feel him in the night air around us. Vida, he'd said. That girl, she's got vida. She's got life, he says over and over again, his voice so loud in my head now, so clear. I feel his breath on the back of my neck, his hands on my shoulders, pushing me toward her, guiding my steps. And he tells me, this is it. Do you understand? This is what we do. This is how we hold on. And I will stop there. Thank you. Christine, unmute yourself. Somebody, I, there's a problem. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me now? You can hear me now? Okay. Yes. I, just so that you all know, um, my participants were at least the participants. Everything is in double letters. Um, the live caption has gone off and on. So. I apologize. I think something's happening maybe with my Zoom. Um, um, anyway, um, so thank you so much, Alex. Your um, writing is beautiful. It's very inspirational. So you um, have a saint for each of your different chapters. How did you come up with your saints? How did you select these saints? Um, I tried to find saints that were attributed one way or another to the the sections that either preceded them or the sections that sort of, you know, um, are, are, were gonna come after them. Um, <laughs> I wanted to find saints that were sort of, um, you know, I wanted a combination of sort of canonical saints, like St. Francis of Assisi and, and, and St. Gabriel, but, but I also wanted some folk saints. So I included uh, Juan Soldado, who I actually also mentioned in, um, in the, the section that I read of Perlas. And Juan Soldado was kind of a folk scene of Tijuana. He was accused of a crime, wrongfully accused of a crime, of a crime so the, the, the story goes, and um, was like, you know, hunted down by a group of, of vigilantes in a town and, and, and um, you know, jailed. I think he died and then people, you know, swore that they heard wailing from his, his grave, and so he was sort of canonized as this folk saint. So I wanted to include uh, folk saints like Juan, Juan Soldado, and I also I felt like I needed because she's just a symbol of of um, Latino culture, particularly Mexican American culture, was the um, Our Lady of Guadalupe, and that's that's who I end on. So it was kind of a combination of trying to find saints that were either connected in one way or another to to the, the sections before them or the sections after, and also you know finding um, some saints with quirky attributes that I sort of wanted to to um, uh, to sort of explore, and, and it was just fun, kind of you know like like Saint Gregory the Wonder Worker, like how could you not use that name? <laughs> like how could you not use you know he's like invoked against like earthquakes and floods and like. You know, how could you not use him? So, um, you know, I really, uh, there were, the, pr the problem was, was trying to find the right, you know, right ones, because there are so many saints, there's so many different saints. And so trying to find the ones that were sort of, that logically made sense, I think was a difficult thing. But yeah, it was a combination of all of those things. Okay, thank you so much. But your, your book is written in English and it was translated into Spanish, but you do have some, um, Spanish language presence in the English version. Mm -hmm. So um, were you trying to, um, what are you trying to do that? Invoke a feeling or um, have us learn Spanish words or um, just add add to the, the book so that we understand you know, I, better? Or I think it's always a question. I think, I think that's always a question of, of um, 
a need and an importance to reflect the accuracy of the community I'm writing about. Um, it's important for me to um, write characters that are, who speak, you know, in a way that is true to them. So, you know, a lot of the characters that I was writing about were characters like the people that lived in the communities that I was raised in. So, you know, we always spoke a mixture of English and Spanish. Um, that's just kind of what we did. It wasn't anything that we really thought about. Um, so that's ultimately was, was my decision was to, to never force it upon any character because there are plenty of characters in the book who are Latino who don't speak Spanish. Um, you know, and, and my approach to that was always like, okay, well, what, what would make sense, you know, um, generationally, like there's that scene when Bedlight encounters the, the um, construction worker, you know, his last name is Dominguez. He, you know, he barely speaks Spanish. He thinks she does and she doesn't, you know. Um, well, she does, but, but, um, but her, primary, her primary language is, is English. Um, and then I have another character who is much older, an older Mexican man who only speaks Spanish. Um, so I think I always, I always have to ask myself, you know, who am I writing generationally? What situation do I have them in? And would it make sense for them to speak English or Spanish? And that's kind of how I make that decision. Um, and, and yeah, and it's always just a question of, of putting words into the lived experiences and realities of characters so that it makes sense to those characters, right? Uh, and, and ultimately that, because that's what the aim of a writer is, is to write characters that are breathable, um, that are complex, um, that kind of challenge our perception of things, so, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So you talked about um, writing this book when you would come home from working. Now, have you, did you do the same thing when you wrote the book, The Five Acts of Diego Leon? Or are, and are you working on another book? Are you still, you're working still, and so you're carving out time to write early in the morning, late at night, or when it comes to you? Well, I've gotten, since I've gotten older, it's harder to stay up yeah. until, you know, one in the morning and not wake up the next day feeling absolutely groggy and crappy. So um, I don't really do that anymore. I don't really write until late at night. Um, when I wrote my second book, you know, I was in a very different uh, place. I had just moved up to the Central Valley. I was away from home. My mother had died. Um, and I kind of felt almost this um, desperation to, to finish, you know, writing this, that book. And that was a very different book. It was, you know, presented other challenges. It was, it was a historical novel. And historical novels are always hard to write. Um, and it was my first tenure track job. And I, you know, I was an assistant professor and I had committee work and meetings and teaching and, and, you know, I was in Fresno and it was really hot and, you know, uh, I didn't know anyone. And, um, so it was a really different place. And I think I, what I, how I wrote then was I just, I wrote when I, when I had time, I wrote when I had a, a moment, you know, a crack in time. Um, you know, my, my third book, which is a nonfiction book, um, I was moving down, back down to LA and I was in the middle of buying a house. Um, I had, you know, changed schools and I was sort of, it was a really crazy time. It was a really absolutely bonkers, horrible, inconvenient time to write a book. But the opportunity presented itself when I wrote it, and it was, it turned out actually to be a very good book. Um, and, you know, it was almost like that the craziness, you know, um, helped really sort of fuel my, my, my um, inspiration. Um, so, you know, oftentimes when, when writers say, like, oh, you know, if I only had time, I need so much time in the day, sometimes it's the opposite. The more time you have, um, the less you know, at least for me, the more time I have, the less writing I get done. Um, and, you know, now I find that I'm, I'm really like, I, I have no real set time. 
um, in the day. As, but my, my aim is always, always, always to write every day, to write at least an hour a day. Um, you know, my, just, my doctor's always, you know, telling me, you know, if you can at least walk an hour a day, like that, that's, you know, do you know what that would do for your, I have like high cholesterol. So it's always like an hour a day, like you'll you have no idea what it'll do to lower your cholesterol. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to walk at least an hour a day. Right. Which is what I do. And that's a, that's the same approach that I take with my writing. If I can write at least an hour a day, then, you know, that, then I'm, I feel good. If I do more than great. So I always try to keep that in perspective. So that's what I do now is I just, I write at least an hour a day. If I take a day or two off, I didn't write today. You know, um, I didn't walk today either because I'm at the spa. I'm going to take the next couple of days off. <clears throat> but that's because I've, I've been so busy the last couple of days, just writing and revising and exercising that, you know, these next four days, I'm like, well, you know, I can deserve to kind of, you know, I give myself a break a little bit. It's important to give yourself breaks also. So, you know, I think each book, that you write, um, your process of writing it changes a little bit because you as a person change, right? So, you know, the process is never the same for me. Um, and I don't think it's ever really the same for any other writers that I know. Some, some are, yeah, some really sort of stick to the same thing. And that, that's, I, I wish I could do that, but, you know, things get messy and complicated and we get pandemics and, you know, just all kinds of stuff just like, happen you know uh it's hard to sort of keep the same pace but you know writing is like life it changes you know you have to sort of follow it thank you Bert. yes writing changes life changes and we move on so um if you have any questions everyone that is attending please put them in the chat and i know alex will answer your questions so um what are you working on something new now I am. I'm, I'm working on a new novel, and the novel is about a family, um, a family in a contemporary Los Angeles who are um, experiencing um, deep and profound loss, and and having to navigate through some of that. Um, it's told from the perspective of three men in the family. Um, there's the the grandfather. Uh, the, the, his son and then the, his grandson. And they each tell a different um, story about ex their experiences growing up as men in our culture and the way in which oftentimes in um, you know, our current sort of reality, um, the male body of color um, is oftentimes called to perform a lot of manual labor uh, and what that manual labor does to our bodies, um, how it mangles our bodies, how it distorts our bodies, how it pulls and stretches and augments our bodies. So um, it's really kind of a meditation on, on this idea of masculinity and this notion of the, the, the brown, the immigrant body as a body, as a spectacle, as a body that is one that is um, pulled and, and tugged and, and almost tortured um, just to survive in um, you know, uh, a world uh, like ours. So um, each, each character in that book deals with um, uh, issues of, of labor uh, and their body being sort of pulled and stretched and tempered in different ways. Um, so yeah, so I've been having a lot of fun, but also, you know, um, it, writing is hard because you do have to face a lot of hard truths sometimes. You're writing things that are not pleasant. Um, and, you know, it really kind of forces you sometimes to think like, what the hell am I doing this for? <laughs> it's not very happy stuff, you know, but we do it, so. So each of your stories are very different. Um, are, do you set out to explore? a different um, idea each time and, and find different um, people to put into the story or are these things that are coming from your past or from your families or that you've dreamt or you've read yes. about? 
all of that. <laughs> all, all of that, all of that, all of that put no, together. I think, I think it is, I think it's all of that. I think it's all of that. It's not, I really can't say it's, it's, it's you know, one or the other. I think it's all of it. You, you know, I, I sometimes I start with a, a character and I saw that there was a question in the chat about what inspires me. Um, I, I think that, you know, it's, sometimes I start with a, a character, a voice comes to me, a line, you know, um, that an, an utter, you know, something that someone might say. Um, sometimes it's, it's an idea, a thought. Um, sometimes it's um, a, something I've noticed, you know, that's happened to me, like, you know, as a, you know, a male, you know, Latino, um, you know, with a disability and, and, and gay, like some of the things that I've had to face, you know, um, it, it comes from, you know, family experiences or conversations. So I think a writer pulls from multiple sources, right? We're sort of like grasping at these little threads of smoke that are sort of swirling around us. And that's, we create story around that. Um, and and we, we hope to, we hope to inspire people. We hope to, um, you know, break their heart and, and then heal it at the same time, you know, with our words. Um, and yeah, and, and sometimes it means, Sometimes that means confronting some really hard truths. You know, sometimes it, it means putting characters in situations that are really kind of bleak. Um, but knowing that, you know, just as in life, it's those moments of, of fear and darkness where we learn the most profound truths about ourselves, right? It's not when things are great and happy. Um, although those are really good moments, but it's when those moments that we're being challenged that we really learn like what we're made of. Right, and it's no different when you're writing a character. Character, because a character has to be like a real life person. So, yeah, all of that inspires me. Other books I've read inspire me. You know, other writers inspire me. You know, I read something I'm like, I want to, you know, I want to write like that, or I want to try that. You know, um, that you know, the stuff that my friends write inspires me. So, yeah, a writer always has to be sort of on. You always have to be looking. You know, because you never know what you're gonna. You, you never know what you're gonna miss. So, um, what is your favorite book, or what was your first book that turned you on to reading and writing as a child? I used to love as a kid those those choose your own adventure books. I loved those choose your own adventure books. Um, I loved um, oh, I loved like ghost stories, like like scary kind of you know like like those goosebumps and like all those like really scary haunted house stories. Um, you know, but, but when I was growing up, you know, when I was in high school, like I didn't read. In my high school, we never read Writers of Color. We read Shakespeare and, and you know, Poe and, and Dickens. And it was like all these old, you know, dead white guys in tights, you know, um, and, you know, uh, speaking with British accents, like I never saw myself in literature, or I never saw the people that, you know, uh, from my neighborhood in literature. And when you don't give people an opportunity to see themselves in books, um, you know, they, they, they don't know what they can aspire to be. I, so I, for the longest time, I thought that that literature was only produced in one place geographically, and that was England. You know, I didn't know that there were Latino writers. I didn't know that there were African-American writers. I didn't know that there were Native American writers. I didn't know that there were queer writers. Um, and it, you know, it, it wasn't until I got to community college that I found this whole plethora of writers of color. And then I got really angry um, because I was upset. And I thought, why did my, you know, why did my high school education, you know, keep this from me? Um, it felt like a, uh, um, like it was a um, betrayal, right? Like I'd been lied to um, and I got really angry. And, um, but, you know, I, as a kid, like I, I just, I mean, it was like, you know, choose your own adventure, ghost stories, a lot of, um, I remember reading as a kid in elementary school, 
are you there god it's me margaret and all the girls in my class got angry at me because it was a book you know about girls and it, it dealt with certain things and um they all got upset and told my teacher or my our elementary school teacher you shouldn't be reading that book because you know it's a book for girls and my teacher said well no like you know actually if he's a boy and he's interested in reading it it's important that he you know has access to it and, and that was when i first realized that there was power that books contained knowledge that was powerful right that there was like something just profound in a book that all of the girls in my class would not want me like on mass get together and go and we were like in fourth fifth grade i mean they were young and they would go to you know they went to mrs renicky and they said don't let him read that book because he's a boy and she said no i think it's okay that he reads it like i think that's cool like you know it, it showed me that there was power i think in literature at that moment and I didn't put two and two together at that time, but but when I look back now, it's I realized like that was probably a moment when I realized like I, I think this is something that I want to learn how to do. You know, I want to I want to learn how to create powerful things like this, that get people like upset and talking and you know question and all of that. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Alex. You have created some absolutely wonderful books, books that have all have given us reason to think and explore and ex think and explore for ourselves and new ideas and to grow. And we thank you very much for sharing your journey with us so that we can um, increase our own journey and learn new things. So uh, it's been a most interesting afternoon with you. Thank you so much. So I want to remind everyone that we have Alex's books in the Pasadena Public Library. You can check them out from the library and you can also purchase your own copies um, if you want to have them from Broman's Bookstore. So um, we can't thank Alex enough for his time with us this afternoon. And we hope that you join the other programs to celebrate National Hispanic Heritage Month. As Alex said, it's very important to realize that there are wonderful authors from all ethnics. And um, we hope that um, students and everyone today um, has all these wonderful experiences that we're able to bring with our Cultural Heritage Month. So thank you so much, Alex. And I'll say good night to all of you. And I hope to welcome you at our other programs. Have a thank lovely you. time at your spa. Enjoy <laughs> your time. so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.